and welcome to this another edition of the Ancient Landmark. My name is Jared Jacobs, and I'm so thankful to be with you, so glad we have this opportunity to once again open up God's Word and to study together. We encourage you, if you will, to get a Bible out and follow along with the things we're going to study as we spend time together in the book of God. What I want us to do at this time is to study from Matthew chapter 25 and about the verse 13 verses or so. Matthew chapter 25 and, and there beginning about verse number 1 talks to us and speaks to us about the parable of the ten virgins. Now, Jesus spoke this parable here at, at this time. This is very close to the time of his uh, uh, betrayal, his arrest and crucifixion and so forth. And in Matthew chapter 25, he talks to us about a parable uh, there connected with his kingdom. And they're discussed uh, as, like I said, the parable of the ten virgins in particular. Now, parables are a unique thing. Parables were things that was almost exclusively spoken by Jesus. In the New Testament especially, in the New Testament it was exclusively spoken by Jesus. There are some Old Testament parables that we read about, of course, but in the New Testament, this is pretty much exclusively Jesus' domain. Parables were a very unique way of teaching and preaching. This was not uh, just simply somebody telling stories. This is not, you know, Jesus running around the countryside telling, you know, big yarns and big windies about uh, something that happened to somebody. Uh, this is not what was going on. Whenever Jesus is speaking in parables, the purpose is to teach. The purpose is to instruct these folks and to tell them the truth concerning well, concerning life and especially concerning the kingdom, the primary um, focus and the primary subject of the parables was always focused upon the kingdom. And you can look in your Bibles in Matthew chapter 13, about verse 34 and 35, and read that the reason why Jesus spoke in parables so much was because this was fulfilling a prophecy. And that was what was promised back in the Psalms, that the Messiah would do. He would uh, speak in pr uh, prophecies so that uh, you know some folks would understand. Those with a spiritual mindset could understand what Jesus was talking about. Those who refused and those who didn't have a spiritual mindset, of course, would not understand. They wouldn't gain the knowledge that they needed to gain, at least at that time. And so he spoke in parables, spoke in that, in what you might consider a, uh, a hidden language, that may not be exactly accurate, but it, it was said in such a way that those who had that correct mindset could understand, they could get it, they could see, and if you didn't, then hopefully you would learn later on. Uh, so many times the apostles, those 12 that Jesus had chosen, Jesus would speak in parables and they would come to him and say, listen, we don't understand this. Would you explain to us what this parable was about? And so Jesus would. And so we have the benefit in our New Testament. We have the benefit not only of the parable, but also the, the explanation many times. Matthew chapter 25 is no exception to that. Matthew chapter 25, we read here about a parable uh, specifically concerning uh, the kingdom of God. In Matthew chapter 25, Jesus begins by saying, Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. And it says, Five of them were wise, and five of them were foolish, and they that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with their lamps. He says, But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But the brides, uh, he said, the bridegroom tarried. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight the cry was made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Verse 7, Then all the virgins rose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said to the wise, Give us uh, of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. The wise answered and said, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But he, she, they said, Go to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they were they that were ready went in with to the marriage, and the door was shut. Verse eleven. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour when the Son of Man cometh. So in this parable, what is described for us is a parable at where a the, we have these ten virgins, they are waiting for the bridegroom to come. And he's going to come to the marriage. 
All right. Now, the just real quickly, the descriptions of marriage, at least the Old Testament practices, is much different than the New Testament practice or the modern day practice. You know, today, whenever we talk about getting married, you know, you have the, you know, the engaged couple, and here's this man and woman, and they're engaged and all that, and they set a date, and they have the date, and they set, and you go to the, to the wedding ceremony first. You go to the wedding ceremony, and they'll say I do's, and make their promises, and all of this, and all the lovely gown, and all of this, and they go, and they make the way, walk down the aisle, they say I do's, they leave the aisle, there's the, you know, people meet, and then later on, you have the party. And we call that the reception, don't we? And so you have the party afterward. And at that time, of course, they open their gifts and so on and so forth and, and all that. Well, in the Old Testament way and, and on in really into the days of Christ, they didn't do it like that. Uh, the Old Testament way of doing things, the Jewish practice, maybe that's a better way to say that, the Jewish practice of a, of a wedding was actually the reverse of what, modern day practices are because what they would do they'd have the party first they would have the party and then the bridegroom would come later on and the the point of that was the bridegroom and and the bride they have made a promise of a certain date to get married and then the groom goes and prepares the house he prepares a place where him and his wife future wife are going to live and so he, he builds the house maybe or, or however he does, purchases it, buys it, gets it ready. Whatever he needs to do to get that house ready, he gets it ready. And once that is ready, then the wedding takes place. And again, they have the party. They have all the reception side of things, if you will. And generally at the end of the party, that's when the wedding takes place. Sometimes they would practice it where maybe they had about a day or so of a party and then maybe that night they would have the wedding and then the party continued on for a few other days. That's kind of the picture you get with Joseph. If you go back in your Bibles in the book of Genesis and they read about Joseph and how that he was tricked or fooled because uh, Leah was given to him instead of Rachel. Well, as you read this, it's, it's, it's very quick, just a couple of verses, but they, they kind of had a party going. That night was the wedding, and then uh, the, the party kept going for a few days, and that's when, of course, he comes back the next morning going, you've lied to me, Ru uh, Laban, you've lied to me, Laban, and you haven't given me the right uh, woman. And he says, fulfill her week, and then I'll give you, the, give you her sister. Well, the week had to do with that party, that reception, and all of that. Well, they'd been, they had uh, had some of the party, then they got married, and then the party continued for a few days. And he said, then after that, then she would have, Rachel would have her wedding. Well, that's kind of the practice here. Whenever uh, you see this going on in Matthew 25, they've obviously been invited to the party. These ten in particular, five wise and five foolish virgins, they've obviously been invited to the party, and they've gone to it, but they don't know exactly when the bridegroom is coming. They got an idea because he's evidently finished the house. They, they have some idea because the party's been, or because the people have been called to the party. But they don't know the exact day. They don't know the time. They don't know when it's going to be. And so they're there kind of waiting around kind of figuring out, well, when is this going to be? And, and so they're there. And then the cry at midnight was made. And then the bridegroom comes. Here's the bridegroom. Go you out to meet him because now they're going to have the wedding. Okay? So that's the picture here. That's what's being involved. And, and I, I explain this to our 21st century minds and 21st century practices because we're not doing things the way they did it back then, obviously. And so here's this party going on. And now the bridegroom comes, and that's when the, the five wise and five foolish virgins, they have to rise, trim their lamps, and all of that, and get ready, and five were left out, and five got to go in. And so you ask the question, well, how could this be? How is this possible? Uh, what lessons can we learn from this account? What lessons can we learn from what is being taught at this time? Well, there's several things here for us to learn. Let me suggest to you there are many similarities between the wise and the foolish virgins. That's the first thing. You know, as, you, as we read this together, Matthew 25, as we, at first glance, we look at these two groups of people, five wise and five foolish, at first you might wonder, well, I don't really see a difference between them. 
I, I really don't notice here. You know, all of them were invited. That's one thing that's similar about them. Every one of them were invited to this wedding. You know, they weren't uh, wedding crashers, all right? They weren't people that were somehow not, not invited or just showing up or just happened to be there. All these folks were invited. That's understood. And obviously what's understood is they all accepted the invitation because all ten were there. So they all accepted that invitation, didn't they? They were there. They didn't, like, again, they didn't just show up, but they all accepted the invitation. In other words, they weren't forced. It wasn't a have-to situation. It wasn't anything like that, but rather the people accepted the invitation. Having accepted the invitation then, the Bible says they were all waiting then on the bridegroom. All ten of them. All ten waited, verse 5. That shows their patience at this time. Their patience or endurance to wait. They all had lamps the same, didn't they? They all had lamps. It wasn't that, you know, two or three of them had lamps and shared with everybody else. It wasn't, wasn't any other combination like that. It was that all ten had a lamp apiece. They all had that and they all had oil in their lamps. If you read Matthew 25, verses 3 through 7 again, all ten of them had oil in their lamps, at least when they started, didn't they? So as I'm looking at these similarities, they've got a lot of things alike, don't they? They all had their lamps burning. They, their lamps were burning at this time. All of them slumbered and slept at the right time as well. If you look in Matthew 25 and verse number 5, they all slumbered and slept while the bridegroom tarried, while, while he was not there. And there wasn't anything wrong with that. It wasn't like it was a sin or wrong to, to sleep. They needed to sleep. They needed to rest. And so that was fine. And all of them slept. All of them then were awakened. If you look in verse 6, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. It wasn't that two or three were woken up and jostled and shaken, saying, Okay, get up. It's time. Okay, you wake up the rest of them. No, the, the one cry woke up everybody. The one cry there that says, The bridegroom is here. Go to meet him. That woke up everyone. They're all awakened by that, aren't they? They all arose to trim their lamps. Matthew 25, verse 7. They all did that. They had to rise. They had to trim the lamps, cut the burnt part of the wick off and all of that and, and get that flame going again for their lamps. It's midnight. They still need a light, light source, don't they? So they've all arose to trim all of their lamps. And so as we look at this, we, we see all of them desired and expected to enter as well. In Matthew 25, verse 11. By the time you get to verse 11 of Matthew chapter 25, even the, the foolish virgins, even there, said that they wanted to come in. The wise ones had already gone in. The foolish ones had bought the oil. They've come back, and now they said, we want to come in too. All ten expected to meet, expected to go in to that wedding. So as you look at this, we see all kinds of similarities between these wise and foolish. So what made the difference? How could you call one group wise and one group foolish when we have so many similarities between them? Well, we know the answer to that. There's just one difference. And my friends, one difference made all the difference between getting in and not. The wise were the ones who brought extra oil with them. And the Bible talks about this, how they brought oil uh, in their vessels with their lamps. They had brought extra oil. That oil made all the difference. See, they had made preparation. And that's the key point right there. They had prepared. They had made arrangements beforehand that they were going to go meet and going to go to this place there to meet, or rather to wait for the bridegroom and then to go meet him later on. Now, how long is that going to take? I have no idea. Whenever they get there, is he going to be there? We don't know. When we get there, maybe, maybe just been there in an hour or two. Will he be there then? We don't know. That's the point. They brought extra oil with them so as to help them wait out their time. The five wise did that. Five wise had decided we're going to go to the extra expense to carry the extra weight with us. I don't know how much this would have weighed, but they're going to carry extra weight with them with the extra oil, also carrying their lamps with them, carrying all that over to this place where the party's going on to wait for the bridegroom to show. They're doing this. And then the five foolish then, of course you had five foolish, didn't you? 
Now, the five foolish didn't do that at all. They didn't have anything to do with that. They didn't uh, have, carry anything extra with them at all. They had their lamps with them, and whatever oil might be in that lamp at that point, that's all they've got with them as they wait for the bridegroom to come. But you, you think about that, that's really the only difference. And we see, we see so many similarities between them. We see similarities between the wise and the foolish, don't we? And they were called by the same call, and they accepted the same invitation, and they, they had all of these things alike, all these things the same. It was one difference. And one difference made all the difference, didn't it? It's just that one thing. But the one difference would keep them out from the wedding itself. They would be left out from of the wedding and not be allowed in. And the door was shut. Remember that? The door was shut on them. And then when they tried to get in, the one there at the door said, I don't know who you are. I don't know you, and you're not getting in. If I don't know you, you're not getting in. How sad that is. What a tragedy that is to think that this one difference would do that. And they were kept out. They were left out. And of course, Jesus' point from the last verse there, he said, Watch therefore, for you know not the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Watch, because you don't know. The word watch means to keep awake. It means to give strict adherence to. It means here that you need to be cautious or take heed when he's talking about watching, it has to do with preparation and has to do with patience as well. So in the preparation and in your patience, that's when the watching takes place. And folks, I need to understand that. I need to see that. I need to understand there are applications to be made to me. There's applications to be made to my life and applications that, that need to be understood as I think about myself, as I think about how I'm living, as I think about how I'm serving God, and all of that. That's the key point. That's the thing I need to see, and that's the thing I need to, to follow through on. You see, when you look into, into this parable, somebody says, well, you know, but, but what does this parable all mean? What's the, what's the purpose of it? What's, what is it for me? Well, there's a lot of things in there. When we begin to break down this parable and we begin to study on it, we begin, begin to look and see just what is the Lord talking about. I want to suggest to you there are many spiritual lessons for us. And of course, that's the point of the parable. The parable is not just to tell you a story about a wedding. The parable is not just to tell you, this is not like Aesop's fables, all right? And I'm afraid a lot of times people treat parables like that, kind of like it's Aesop's fables or kind of like it's you know Grimm's fairy tales or something like that and just some story just something maybe has a moral to it and, and all of that and it's all nice and good, but it really didn't have any meaning. Well, that's wrong. A parable has a spiritual meaning that portrays spiritual truth. And I need to understand that. I need to see that. I need to appreciate that. Because the spiritual truth that is there is what applies to me. I may not ever uh, be invited to a wedding or I may never see a wedding feast such as what the Lord has described here, and that's okay. I need to understand the spiritual side, the spiritual application, the spiritual truth. And that's what I want to talk about here in just a moment. But let me pause and remind you, this program is brought to you by the Caneyville Church of Christ. The Caneyville Church of Christ meets together on the Lord's Day at 10 a.m. for Bible study, 1045 for morning worship, and 5 in the afternoon for worship. We also meet Wednesday night for se at 7 for a period of Bible study. You'll be our honored guest if you come and be with us at any and every time that you can. We would love to see you. We meet just uh, right across the road from the Sacramento Bank. They're near the intersection of Highway 62 and Highway 79. And you'd be our honored guest. We'd love to see you. We'd love for you to come and be with us at any and every time that you can. Uh, we would love for you to come and visit our website, CaneyvilleChurchOfChrist.com, or see us on Facebook. Look us up on Facebook. You can find us there, Caneyville Church of Christ. Look us up. We strive to, to update things several times during the week and to have uh, archive radio programs and archive videos and, and archive bulletins and reading material and all kinds of studies for you. And uh, certainly you're welcome to, to look at those, to study those, to download them. Uh, send us an email, send us text if you have any questions at all. And certainly if you have any questions or if you'd like to, to schedule a Bible study, 
where we just sit down and talk about God's Word together. I'd love to do that. Call me, 589-4167. You can call me. You can text me. Uh, if you'd like to have a Bible correspondence course, we can set that up as well. And you can join those who are taking part in the Bible correspondence course. And uh, it's just uh, one lesson at a time. You send us a lesson and we'll grade it. And we'll send it back to you in the next lesson and so on and so forth. And uh, if you'd like a correspondence course, we can set that up. Again, call me. Call me, 589-4167. We'll talk about God's Word. We'll study. We'll send you a Bible correspondence course. It's absolutely free. No obligations or anything like that. We just want, to, want you to study God's Word. We just want and, and solicit your time to, to look at God's Word, to find out what God's Word says, and live it and follow it all the days of your life. We can help you with that. That's what we want to do. So... Uh, contact me. Let's talk about God's Word. You can text or email or call me or whatever you'd like to do. Well, let's jump back into our study then. In Matthew 25, what is the purpose? What is the meaning behind this? Well, there's a bridegroom, wasn't there? Hold the bridegroom cometh. He's been the main focus, really. That's what. That's who we've been waiting on here in Matthew 25. We've been waiting on him, and finally he's here, and we're ready to go into the into the marriage. Well, who is the bridegroom? Well, that's going to be Christ. And in any other context, we see this. In John chapter 3, for example, whenever John the Baptist was talking about Jesus, he calls him the bridegroom. And he says, I'm not the bridegroom. John says, I'm not the bridegroom. He said, I'm the friend of the groom. But he said, I rejoice for the bridegroom. I rejoice for him that he is getting married and so forth. So the bridegroom is Christ. And he's the one who was uh, coming back, coming on the scene. And you get another picture of that in John chapter 14 where he talks about uh, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house of many mansions, I, or he said, in my Father's house of many mansions, if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there you may be also. That again is the picture of the wedding feast. I'm going to prepare a place and I'll come about, I'm going to come back and get you. You see the same picture in Revelation chapter 19 especially of the bridegroom, Christ, and the church being his bride. The bride adorned for her husband. And so you see this again. And so it shouldn't be any surprise in Matthew 25 then in the parable with the bridegroom that that's going to be Jesus. Well, you have the ten virgins then. Who are the ten virgins? Well, the ten virgins are really, they're God's people. They're Christians. It's not... Uh, five in the church and five in the world. I've heard people say that sometimes. Five in the church and five in the world. No, 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 no. All ten of them are, belong to the Lord. Ten virgins. And again, that picture in Ephesians chapter 5, for example, speaks about the Lord's church being presented as the chaste virgin to Christ. And so here we have that picture once more. James 1 and verse 27 talks about how we need to be undefiled. Pure and undefiled. And so that, that picture there once more. So the bridegroom is Christ, and here's the ten virgins. That would be his, his church. But if I have five wise and five foolish, well, there's a problem right there. And uh, if I didn't have any other verse in the Bible to use, but that one I can prove that when it comes to uh, Jesus and it comes to the, to the church, you can fall away. You had some that were left out. Though they were considered at one point a part, though they were considered at one point in, included in this group, something happened and they got left out. Something happened and the door was shut. See that? And yes, uh, if I had no other verse in the Bible, I can show you that when it comes to being the, the child of God, when it comes to being uh, belonging to the Lord, that yes, you can fall away. Yes, you can ultimately and finally be left out. Because it wasn't a matter of, well, these folks are in the world and these folks were in the church. It wasn't that at all. They both were in the same relationship. Both. But at the end of it, that's where the problem came in because they weren't prepared. And more on that in a moment. Because you had the oil. Well, here's the oil symbolic of that preparation or that patience. Again, these five wise virgins were prepared for the contingency that he might not be there when we show up. He might not just be right on time. He might not be on our time schedule, believe it or not. 
And if he's not on our time schedule, are we going to be prepared? Are we going to be waiting for him? Are we going to be ready? And that's what you find here. And so here is the oil where five were prepared. Five were ready. Five were not. Five had patience. Five had preparation. Five didn't had, did not have any preparation at all. And so again, that's why I show you, it's not once saved, always saved. The Bible never teaches that. doesn't teach it one time in the Scripture, never in the Old Testament or the New Testament. And certainly in these parables, and this is one example, in this parable, it's not once saved, always saved. It wasn't that at all, because here were, were a group of people who got left out. They had waited. They were there. They were in the same group. But when it came right down to it, the door was shut because you had people unprepared. Unprepared to meet God. That's a fact. And that, of course, uh, places the, the onus on us to make sure I am prepared, I am ready for the Lord's return. When is he coming back? I don't know. I don't know when it's going to be, but I know I've got to get ready. And I've got to get ready, whether that means to become a Christian in the first place, to have my sins forgiven through faith in Christ, to repent of my sins, confess my faith in Him and be baptized for the remission of sins, to start out with that. Or it means I need to continue to stay faithful, to continue to be faithful unto death, Revelation 2.10, to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, 1 Corinthians 15.58. But either way, I need to be ready. I need to be to be prepared, I need to be watching and because the Lord is going to come back. And that being the case, I need to be ready. And don't put it off. I need to be prepared. The oil was that sim symbol of preparation that they were ready. Of course, a cry made at midnight. What does that mean? Well, we don't know when the Lord's going to come back. We don't know when it's going to be. Is it midnight, two in the morning, when it's going to be, we have no idea. The cry was made at midnight when they were asleep. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. And of course, the foolish wanted, uh, they wanted oil, didn't they? Give us some of your oil so we can go on into the wedding. Well, that's the request of the foolish people. That's the request of mercy. And the thing of it is, mercy can only be given for a certain period of time. And then after that, it's too late. After that, there's no more time for mercy. They waited too late for mercy. They waited too late for this. And that's why they said, there's not enough for us and you. We cannot give you of ours. If we give you of ours, we don't have enough. So we can't do that. The preparation that must be made must be made for each person individually. That mercy must be realized and must be accepted only, and you can only do it at that point. You can only do it then, while you're upon the earth, while, here and now. That's the uh, fact that the New Testament stresses urgency so much. It stresses to be urgent and to do things now. Do things while you still can. Be saved now. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation, Second Corinthians 6, 2. That's why it says that. Is because we only have now. And so they requested mercy and it was too late. They tried to go get their preparation. By their preparation, it was too late. The door was shut. The door being shut symbolizes the fact that one day heaven's gates are closed against the unprepared. The only time you have to prepare is now, my friends. The time you have to get ready is now and do it without delay. To do what the Lord says, to be what the Bible makes you, and to serve Him, and to serve Him today while you still can. Become a Christian through faith, repentance, and confession, and baptism. If you've done those things, you've fallen away from God, you need to come back, come back to Him, and do so now while you still can. Repent of what you've done, confess those things, pray God to forgive you. If I can help you in any way, I want to do it. If I can help you and encourage you to do the right thing, and to be what the Bible makes you, I want to do that today. Call me. Let's hear from you. I'm so thankful for this opportunity. I'm so thankful for this time together. I do appreciate the fact that you've, that you've listened and the fact that we can be together like this. And I hope this has been a helpful study for you. And until next time, Lord willing, we bid you good day.